How did a poor family living in Victorian London earn enough money to survive, to buy bread and keep a roof over their head? The short answer is that to pay their way in life, they sold their souls for work. Long hours of miserable toil, often in unsanitary conditions and in return for the most meagre of an income. This wasn't a choice. These were people victim to a world where the only social support for the sick and unemployed was charity or the goodwill of family. And many, in hard times, found neither. If your wages were insufficient to feed yourself and pay for your lodgings, you faced a stark choice. Work all the hours of the day, every single day, or turn to crime and prostitution. Many worked and worked their bodies into a pauper's coffin, such that their souls might find rest not granted to their bodies in life. In this video, you will discover the financial and physical cost of life for several working class people in 19th century London. Find out why there was little money for leisure activities, let alone time for anything other than work, and how wages were so low that even parents feared the introduction of laws that would prevent their children working to supplement the family budget. This account is told by Jack London, an American journalist and social activist who, disguising himself in working-class clothes, journeyed through the East End of London so as to experience the struggles of everyday people for himself. Note that he was writing for an American audience, and therefore you will often hear the wages and prices quoted in dollars and cents. Before we move on, please consider clicking the subscribe button for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. Please check out the description to see how you can support the channel and the content we make. Some sell their lives for bread. Some sell their souls for gold. Some seek the riverbed. Some seek the workhouse mould. Such is proud England's sway, where wealth may work its will. Flesh is cheap today, souls are cheaper still. When I learned that in Lesser London there were 1,292,737 people who received 21 shillings or less a week per family, I became interested as to how the wages could best be spent in order to maintain the physical efficiency of such families, families of six, seven, eight, or ten being beyond consideration. I have based the following expenditures upon a family of five, a father, mother, and three children, while I have made twenty-one shillings equivalent to five dollars twenty-five cents, though actually... 21 shillings are equivalent to about $5.11. An analysis of one item alone will show how little there is for waste. Bread, $1 for a family of five for seven days. $1 worth of bread will give each a daily ration of nearly three cents. And if they eat three meals a day, each may consume per meal nine and a half mills, worth of bread, a little less than one cent's worth. Now bread is the heaviest item. They will get less of meat per mouth each meal, and still less of vegetables, while the smaller items become too microscopic for consideration. On the other hand, these food articles are all bought at small retail, the most expensive and wasteful method of purchasing. While the expenditures on food mentioned will permit no extravagance, no overloading of stomachs, it will be noticed that there is no surplus. The whole $5.25 is spent for food and rent. There is no pocket money left over. Does the man buy a glass of beer, the family must eat that much less, and in so far as it eats less, just that far will it impair its physical efficiency. The members of this family cannot ride in buses or trams, cannot write letters, take outings, go to a tuppenny gaff for cheap vaudeville, join social or benefit clubs, nor can they buy sweetmeats, tobacco, books or newspapers. And further, should one child, and there are three, require a pair of shoes, 
the family must strike meat for a week from its bill of fare, and, since there are five pairs of feet requiring shoes, and five heads requiring hats, and five bodies requiring clothes, and since there are laws regulating indecency, the family must constantly impair its physical efficiency in order to keep warm and out of jail. For notice, when rent, coals, oil, soap, and firewood are extracted from the weekly income, there remains a daily allowance for food of nine cents to each person. And that nine cents cannot be lessened by buying clothes without impairing the physical efficiency. All of which is hard enough. But the thing happens. The husband and father breaks his leg or his neck. No nine cents a day per mouth for food is coming in. No nine and a half mils worth of bread per meal. And... At the end of the week, no one dollar fifty cents for rent. So out they must go, to the streets or the workhouse, or to a miserable den somewhere, in which the mother will desperately endeavour to hold the family together on the ten shillings she may possibly be able to earn. While in Lesser London there are 1,292,737 people who receive 21 shillings or less a week per family, it must be remembered that we have investigated a family of five living on a 21 shillings basis. There are larger families. There are many families that live on less than 21 shillings. And there is much irregular employment. The question naturally arises, how do they live? The answer is that they do not live. They do not know what life is. They drag out a subterbestial existence until mercifully released by death. Before descending to the fouler depths, let the case of the telegraph girls be cited. Here are clean, fresh English maids, for whom a higher standard of living than that of the beasts is absolutely necessary. Otherwise, they cannot remain clean, fresh English maids. On entering the service, a telephone girl receives a weekly wage of $2.75. If she be quick and clever, she may, at the end of five years, attain a maximum wage of $5. Recently, a table of such a girl's weekly expenditure was furnished to Lord London Derry. It leaves nothing for clothes, recreation, or sickness. And yet many of the girls are receiving not $4.50, but $2.75, $3, and $3.50 per week. They must have clothes and recreation. And man to man too oft unjust is always so to woman. At the Trade Union Congress now being held in London, the Gas Workers Union moved that instructions be given the Parliamentary Committee to introduce a bill to prohibit the employment of children under 15 years of age. Mr. Shackleton, Member of Parliament and a representative of the Northern Counties Weavers, opposed the resolution on behalf of the textile workers, who, he said, could not dispense with the earnings of their children and live on the scale of wages which obtained. The representatives of 514,000 workers voted against the resolution, while the representatives of 535,000 workers voted in favour of it. When 514,000 workers oppose a resolution prohibiting child labour under 15, it is evident that a less-than-living wage is being paid to an immense number of the adult workers of the country. I have spoken with women in Whitechapel who receive right along less than 25 cents for a 12-hour day in the coat-making sweatshops, and with women trousers finishers who receive an average princely and weekly wage of 75 cents to one dollar. A case recently cropped up of men in the employ of a wealthy business house, receiving their board and $1.50 per week for six working days of 16 hours each. The sandwich men get 27 cents per day and find themselves 
The average weekly earnings of the hawkers and costermongers are not more than $2.50 to $3. The average of all common labourers outside the dockers is less than $4 per week, while the dockers average from $2 to $2.25. These figures are taken from a Royal Commission report and are authentic. Conceive of an old woman, broken and dying supporting herself and four children, and paying 75 cents per week rent by making matchboxes at four and a half cents per gross, twelve dozen boxes for four and a half cents, and, in addition, finding her own paste and thread. She never knew a day off, either for sickness, rest, or recreation. Each day, and every day, Sundays as well, she toiled fourteen hours. Her day's stint was seven gross, for which she received thirty-one and a half cents. In the week of ninety-eight hours' work, she made seven thousand and sixty-six matchboxes and earned two dollars twenty cents, less her paste and thread. Mr. Thomas Holmes a police court missionary of note, after writing about the condition of the women workers, received the following letter, dated April 18th, 1901. Sir, pardon the liberty I am taking, but having read what you said about poor women working fourteen hours a day for ten shillings per week, I beg to state my case. I am a tie-maker, who, after working all the week, cannot earn more than five shillings, and I have a poor afflicted husband to keep who hasn't earned a penny for more than ten years. Imagine a woman, capable of writing such a clear, sensible, grammatical letter, supporting her husband and self on five shillings, one dollar twenty-five cents, per week. Mr. Holmes visited her. He had to squeeze to get into the room. There lay her sick husband. There she worked all day long. There she cooked, ate, washed, and slept. And there her husband and she performed all the functions of living and dying. There was no space for the missionary to sit down, save on the bed, which was partially covered with ties and silk. The sick man's lungs were in the last stages of decay. He coughed and expectorated constantly the woman ceasing from her work to assist him in his paroxysms. The silken fluff from the ties was not good for his sickness, nor was his sickness good for the ties, and the handlers and wearers of the ties yet to come. Another case Mr. Holmes visited was that of a young girl, twelve years of age, charged in the police court with stealing food. He found her the deputy mother of a boy of nine, a crippled boy of seven, and a younger child. Her mother was a widow and a blouse maker. She paid one dollar twenty-five cents a week rent. Here are the last items in her housekeeping account. Tea, one cent. Sugar, one cent. Bread, half a cent. Margarine, two cents, oil, three cents, and firewood, one cent. Good housewives of the soft and tender folk, imagine yourselves marketing and keeping a house on such a scale, setting a table for five, and keeping an eye on your deputy mother of twelve to see that she did not steal food for her little brother's and sisters, the while you stitched, stitched, stitched at a nightmare line of blouses which stretched away into the gloom and down to the pauper's coffin waiting for you.